In today's episode, we talk with Jessica Du, who is most recently one of the members on the executive leadership team for one of the largest animal sanctuaries in the United States. In this conversation, we talk about animal care, food systems, and how this relates to social justice. So I invite you to listen to this conversation with an open heart and an open mind. Hi, everyone, and welcome to How the Wise One Grows. Today, we have a very special episode, but before we get started, we're going to land here together, as we always do, with three deep breaths. So wherever you are, find a space that feels safe for you. And if it's safe, you can gently rest your eyes. If you're driving, please do not. And just soften your gaze at a point in front of you. And notice where your body meets the earth. And allow your shoulders to soften down your back. Take a big breath in. And a big breath out. Inhale, fill your chest, fill your belly with air. Exhale, open your mouth, let it out. One more, inhale. And exhale. And you can slowly return to this space. So we are having an exciting conversation today with Jessica Du. Jessica brings over a decade of expertise and experience providing specialized care to rescued and rehabilitated farm animals at sanctuaries across the country, partnering with UCLA, UC Davis, and Cornell University. Most recently, as a member of the executive leadership team for one of the largest sanctuaries in the United States, Jessica led national animal care, rescue, and placement. For the past decade, Jessica has implemented sanctuary best practices, standard operating procedures, strategic planning, programmatic alignment, and integration while partnering with and supporting multiple other sanctuaries across the country. Jessica began her career in animal care and rescue at a national sanctuary before co-founding her own care farm and has served as a keynote speaker at conferences and has been featured on podcasts, fundraising galas, and by media outlets including the LA Times, Animal Planet, and NPR. Her work includes contributions to legislative advocacy and policy reform. Through her advocacy, Jessica believes in addressing interrelated issues of oppression and approaches her work through a social justice lens, centering diversity, equity, and inclusion within the animal protection movement and raising systemic issues of access to food and land. Jessica supports her farm worker rights and centering BIPOC perspectives and voices. Wow. Thank you so much for being here today, Jessica. Thank you, Holly, for having me on your podcast and for the introduction. Um, I'm thankful to be here and share space with you and be in conversation with you today. I'm so excited, too. Uh, well, Jessica and I met when I was visiting um, my brother and his girlfriend in L.A., and I got to go visit this amazing farm sanctuary that Jessica was working on. And she really opened my eyes in a way that has um, to issues around food and um, animal care that has really impacted my day-to-day -day life in ways that I'm engaging with food in my day-to-day so I was wondering if you would mind sharing when you first became interested in animal and animal care and rescue. Mm, yes, um, it's a great question. And I love to share this story. Um, I wanted to take a moment before I started and say, you know, my name is Jessica Du, and I go by her, they pronouns and I mm -hmm. reside and I'm speaking today from the native sovereign uh, nation land of the Fernandino Tatavian tribe. So I wanted to take a second and honor that. Thank you so much for naming that. Um, 
So I first became interested in animals and the multi-species community at a very early age. Um, I was raised vegetarian and naked in the, the mountains um, of Northern <laughs> California. Yes. So I was, um, my upbringing was one that I just, I knew we were all linked from the soil and the trees um, to the wildlife and one another to the clothes we wore um, and the food we ate and um, that we were all part of this like larger ecosystem. And even at a young age, I was, it always, I always found it so wild how disconnected people were to their communities and, and the food they ate and, and the land they resided on. Um, and so I began my advocacy work uh, as a kid, you know, um, at that, at a very young age because of that knowledge. And before the internet, I'm, I know I'm dating myself there, um, Holly, <laughs> but um, before the internet, I would go to the local library and get um, addresses for politicians all across the world. And I would write to them and, and plead for them to end well and dolphin slaughter. And mm. when I moved to Southern California, um, I was looking for a job. And I remember talking to my partner at the, uh, and I was like, I don't wanna get into the corporate world. Um, and I don't want to be in the industry because it seemed like everyone mm -hmm. in LA is in the industry. And I really wanted to go back to those roots that, you know, my childhood roots. And I found a job at a, a sanctuary for farmed animals um, that was close by. And Holly, I remember going into the, the sanctuary and I was talking to my new colleagues and, and, um, they asked me how long I had been vegan and I was horrified and I was wondering where I had taken the wrong turn. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. um, I explained that I had been vegetarian my entire life and I, you know, hadn't eaten animals because, you know, and I, I felt vegan as, or vegetarianism was what saved animals. You know, I, I didn't, I thought veganism was like, extreme and I didn't understand it and I, mm -hmm. I I felt like I could never give up cheese and and, <laughs> and, and why should I uh, a common fear <laughs> giving up cheese 1000 percent. it's something I hear all the time and um and I probably like on my face I, I know I didn't say the last part of like veganism is a little bit extreme but I'm sure my face showed that to my new colleagues mm -hmm. and uh, my colleagues asked me uh, so where did I think milk came from? And I remember the way they asked that question. It made me question like everything I thought I knew. And I was slightly like hesitant in giving a very, very like an, an answer that I knew, you know, like, well, dairy cows mm -hmm. that produce milk, you know, I've seen the commercials, happy cows come from California. Um, <laughs> and and they said, you know, how do you think, um, or how do humans produce milk? And I was like, oh, well, you have to be you know, pregnant or Im impregnated. And, and they let me like, they let air take up the space, you know? And my mind was like connecting all the dots. And I, I just looked at them and I was like, I have so many questions <laughs> like like as the light bulbs were like going yeah connecting it and the colleagues said you know what why don't you go home tonight watch a, a three minute behind the scene um undercover um video about the dairy industry and if you if you care to i'd love to hear how you feel about it tomorrow and i went home and i got about 30 seconds into that video and I was horrified mm -hmm. and I, I just had no idea about the, uh, the horrors of the, the dairy industry. And so once I knew I, I really couldn't go back. Um, 
it's been a decade now, over a decade since that moment. And that conversation really helped me shift my gears to towards that like food system transformation through animal care and rescue in the sanctuary community. You know, I was realizing at that time and as all those light bulbs were going off is, you know, it's simple to cast blame. You know, I had, like I had previously mm -hmm. done on other countries and cultures that for eating, you know, animals, whales and dolphins or feeling outrage over a lion being killed and and not realizing that I had been part of the same oppressive systems like right here at home and mm. the animals deemed worthy through human supremacy standards were just different. And mm. that's, that really began my shift in, into veganism and, and food system transformation and animal care. Um, yeah, sorry, that's a long answer to <laughs> how do you, you know, <laughs> feel about or how did you find yourself in animal care? But yeah, I really appreciate you sharing that story with us. And especially the, I think I had this moment when I was on the farm with you and we were talking about dairy and I was like, I connected those dots mm. for the first time. And I'm sure a lot of people listening right now are like, what? Mm -hmm. That's how it's something we don't think about because we're so disconnected from the systems mm. and the process. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But I have so many questions. Yes. So do you mind sharing just first of all, like what is animal care and what is mm. the animal protection movement? Mm -hmm. Yes. I mean, so there are, there are human animals and non-human animals that I think of when you when you ask that question. Mm. Um, caregiving is a part of my soul. Um, I've been a caregiver for almost two decades. Um, I first started in human animals um, and then moving to non-human animals over the last decade. And I've, I've, for, I've seen firsthand the struggles of working in that care field. Um, when I first started in the non-human animal care field with animals that we farm, you know, Holly, there was no formal training. There was no like protocol, schedule, information guides, behavioral training, emergency plans, you know, um, and the hands-on training was so heavily focused on the medical side of, of caregiving. And it was really mm -hmm. like emergency based care. And um, I was essentially like thrown into a caregiving shift. And as most are, you're running from one barn to the next and you're, you know, feeding out, you're giving medications, you're doing wound care, you're briefly looking around to see if there's like anything out of the ordinary or anything that stands out. And then you're moving on to the next barn. Mm. Um, I found in the animal care movement is, is it's easy to get into the do it now and ask later kind of framework. Uh huh. You know, especially when you're overwhelmed with new information, when you're looking at your leaders and everyone and, and they're saying, well, it's, this is how we've always done it. Um, you often put your head down and you're like, okay, well, if I knew more, I wouldn't question this or, you know, I just don't understand yet. And I will one day. And so you kind of bury that and, and you go about it and um, you just, you know, for me, I was like, I just need to educate myself and then I can ask later. And um, it was about a year into caregiving that I started to ask why. And why are we creating these day-to-day -to, -day to do lists that didn't allow anyone to thrive um, in that current measurement of success? It you know, we were, we weren't having time to learn. We weren't having time to get to know the residents. We weren't able to ask what quality of life it was and why, you know, and what, like even take a moment and think the residents that reside at Sanctuary, like what did they want and how did they think life was to thrive? What was life for them to thrive? They didn't ask to be here. Um, even though it's a sanctuary, they didn't ask to be here. And so, yeah. you know, thinking through that and 
how do you create agency for somebody that didn't ask to be there? You know, so I started questioning this and, and then I was wondering, why are we scared to ask why in the beginning? You know, and so I, I began really examining and, and truly asking these questions of what it meant to be in a multi-species community. And I, I started asking other sanctuary workers. I, I was asking the, my fellow caregivers. I was asking um, other people in the, the animal rights protection movement of what they considered a measurement of success and how, and how did they approach their work. And I, and how do you move from a scarcity mindset of that, like, go, 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 and like barely getting by, heavy burnout, turnover, to like an abundance approach, an abundance mindset. And because everyone's trying their best, um, most often in the sanctuary community, it's with little to no resources. It's one person doing the care of, you know, um, upwards to 100 animals. Um, there was paid, you know, uh, disparaging between caregivers and other staff members. And I just, I, you know, kept questioning and wondering what, what this was. And as soon as I moved into a leadership role, I used all of that data I had collected over the years. And I was able to create an umbrella framework of animal care. So that really represented that holistic approach to an abundance mindset and changing even titles of what was typically called like the cleaning and grounds and facility. They, that was, you know, their titles. And I'm like, but you're doing care. You're providing care. You're providing an environment. You're, you're part of their, the overall care practice, your caregivers. And looking at the heavy medical side of caregiving. And I was like, but you're wellness caregivers. You're, you're, you're looking at how to enrich these lives. You're not looking at medical, only medical, right? You're looking at how to really create a life that embodies sanctuary, embodies a thriving environment. And, you know, by reimagining what care was and what, the measurement of success was, you know, then you start learning, then you start having learning opportunities for your teams and you have professional growth opportunities and you see them starting to thrive themselves and be supported and feel valued for the work they're doing. And so when you ask me what care means to me, it's so deep. It's, it's rooted in who I am and how I approach my day to day and I approach my career and, and my passion and my calling for caregiving in the sanctuary community. And um, I, my goals <laughs> and care is, is what I've made, you know, to move through, move from surviving to thriving, to flourishing and and that all comes from that care perspective and, and how we each should feel each day. You know, we care for ourselves. We care for the loved ones around us. And um, yeah, so really just embodying that care. Um, yeah, yeah, it sounds like a very holistic mm -hmm. approach to care. And it a lot of what I'm hearing, I think, is unfortunately pretty foreign to most mm -hmm. people but it's really seeing these animal beings as equals mm -hmm. and having like a reciprocal relationship mm -hmm. with them versus just one of taking and taking my dog is having <laughs> a lot of fun barking outside the window she's like you're talking about animals yeah, me, me? <laughs> me? <laughs> i hear your voice <laughs> love that <laughs> But yeah, one one where it's more it's not just taking mm -hmm. and it's honoring and trying to understand this other being that might speak in another language that we don't quite understand mm -hmm. um, based off of what we've been learned and trained to see things as. Right. So I really like that it's that more holistic approach to approaching care and, and seeing these other beings as life just mm -hmm. as we are life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, 
we're so disconnected in this world right like right now like with all the technology with all of you know even during covid isolation and you know even just then to the food system and and you know that whole approach we're all so disconnected from one another and um it's so important to take a moment and breathe like we started this podcast today with breathing grounding and seeing how you can the next step is is embodying that care that you you want for yourself but then how can you share that to the community around you mm, mm-hmm. yes it's beautiful so for those who are more foreign to these things mm. can you break down what a sanctuary is like what is a farm sanctuary this was new to me okay yeah um i think sanctuary could be a physical space I also think it could be, you know, theoretically like a space of like my grandma's sanctuary to me, you know, Mm. like um, sanctuaries when it comes to animals we farm are, um, you know, there's, they're everywhere right now there. You can find in your local community, a sanctuary, most likely for either a farm animal or domestic animals like dogs and cats. Um, Sanctuary is providing refuge for animals that have escaped either from self-liberation or been rescued out of the animal agriculture industry. So in where they, they have safety, they have the ability to live long, healthy lives. They have enrichment. They have the foods they need to really ensure the wellness and the well-being of, of who they are as individuals, not because of what we want to consume from them, right? That will be not as a product, but as an individual. Um, at Sanctuary, they're given a name where historically they've had a tag maybe or a band mm. or a brand um in the masses you know they're given individualized care and and that identity um and and promise you know of not having not them not being vulnerable to harm again you know i think that's that's a tricky one because when I think of caregiving, um, and I'm sorry if I digress and go everywhere with what I'm <laughs> talking about, but uh, you know, something I thought a lot about is um, when you're a resident at a sanctuary, you know, and you're free from the animal agriculture industry, your day to day is whatever you want it to be, right? You can either spend it in the ponds taking naps you can be exploring on the hills you can be playing Mm -hmm. on play structures you can seeking out your caregivers for love and affection you know it's it's you have that agency um when it comes to care there's certain things that as caregivers and as our you know obligation for them as they reside at sanctuary um is to provide care right like do they have their vaccine vaccines are their hoofs trimmed are they um did they have an infection when they came in did they get their antibiotics are they you know on routine monitors um and how do you provide that while also providing agency Mm. at sanctuary so if you're here and we know we have to do this because it's all like we can't be neglectful right like we they need this care but how do you then encourage them the agency within sanctuary to be able to desire to get your hoof trimmed to have feet like it be fear free to be stressed Mm -hmm. you know um if you've ever heard a pig get their hoof like trimmed it sounds you know it can sound really like loud and and a little shocking if you haven't heard it before and you're like you're getting your you're getting a pedicure you know Mm -hmm. (laughs) so I'm I'm digressing of like what that sanctuary means because it's complicated yeah Um, a safe haven is you know a sanctuary it's 
you in a closet reading a book and you're feeling safe, mm-hmm. um, you're free from harm and um, judgment and oppression. Um, when I think of sanctuary, I think of music, listening to ears and you're, you know, in a different world. I think sanctuary is different for every single person. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that a lot. And it sounds a lot, again, like honoring those beings that are in that space and and tuning into the whole soul that's there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how, and this is, I'm sure you know tons (laughs) on this, but many listening might be totally new to this. So how does animal care relate to food systems and how can that relate to social justice? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's another really great question, Holly. Um, You know, our, our food system is the premise of, you know, or our, our food systems. Yeah. Premise on white, on human supremacy really over our fellow animals and the quote unquote natural world. Um, It's deep. Can you talk about human supremacy? I've never heard that term before, but it sounds important. Yeah. So human supremacy is as humans, we feel um, entitled to the natural world, right? We, we can dictate, we have the power to, dictate what the animal's lives are. We dictate, depending on where you live, what animals are worthy of a life of freedom or being considered a domestic animal, like a dog and cat and get to live with you and, you know, beloved part of the family to who is then killed for your meal. It's, Mm -hmm. it's through that the human perspective over our fellow animals, often over our fellow human beings, even. Um, and it could be related to the natural environment, too, and the planet. 1,000%. Yeah. So it's through that lens, instead of looking it. at it as we're part of this ecosystem, we're part of these, the natural part world. Part of a whole. Yeah. We were removed and even elevated in that. Got it. Um, Thank you for breaking that part down. Yeah, of course. You know, and all of that is, has deep roots in colonization, white supremacy, racial injustice, enslavement, um, and the genocide and erasure of you know, and displacement of indigenous peoples. So when you sit down, typically, right, if you go to grab a meal and, um, or sit down with a friend for a meal, um, rarely as when we're eating and when we're sharing meal, do we think of how that meal got, how that meal was possible even. Um, That's not taken into account. Um, We don't think of the million plus um, people that work in in the fields, in processing plants, in factory farms, in slaughterhouses. So, and the system's designed that way. It's designed to be hidden so that the dangerous work that they do um, is hidden from from public eye. Um, When you look at areas that these facilities um, have been placed, you will often find low income communities of color. Um, Their homes and their communities are often riddled with the effects of animal agriculture industry. And from like water waste runoff to, um, you know, health issues to oppressive and abusive work environments, um, such as like long hours and high risk to injury, um, and minimal pay. So this targeting of people of color is called environmental racism and a large percentage of the workers, um, are, you know, low income people of color, many undocumented, um, who have few options of, jobs and to be able to provide for their families and 
injuries are so common on the, the on these hazardous jobs. Um, workers often suffer um, incidences uh, from even amputation um, to because of like the severe like speed of like the the processing lines. I don't know if you know that this Holly, but OSHA. Um, released a report and the, and the data said that there are about two amputations every month in, wow. in meat package, like meat processing. Wow. And then there are like many more severe injuries that result in hospitalization. But because many of like the people that are working in this situation are, um, migrants and undocumented workers they're they're threatened for uh deportation if they report any of the like mistreatment or the condition or the the um injuries so it's it's you know when we when we can provide care to ourselves in our community um the lands and the animals and by choosing uh, a diet free of animal products were since the the food system is is built around these industrialized like agricultural like practices what we eat contributes to these cruel practices right these unjust systems and so if you like personally i i'm you know a vegan i try to eat local produce as much as possible local organic produce um i attempt to grow a lot of my own food um using permaculture techniques um and i if you have like a c uh a csa like which is a community um sponsored agriculture the um i would suggest it you can farmers markets and um, I, I highly recommend organic because it reduces the amount of chemicals that you're ingesting, but also that the workers are mm. subjected to. And yeah, I, I just, I think everyone can make a difference with this. Um, no act is too small. Literally every act that you do can fight these systems of oppression um, by how you approach even even the meals you're eating and acknowledging all of that history like how did that meal get to your plate yeah you know well I think that's I'm really appreciate you naming that because I think typically when the average person thinks about a a meal or being a vegan or a vegetarian they think oh about animal rights Mm. but it's so linked to human rights Mm -hmm. on a very deep level that we are so detached from not only you know where these things are coming from and the huge implications they have on the environment as well but also the people that are part of these processes Mm -hmm. and I think like you said like after visiting the farm with you I've made pretty significant changes to my day-to-day diet um and even my husband, he's not as like taken the full leap yeah. as I am um, or more, a bigger leap. Mm-hmm. But he, you know, has now like he's like, yeah, I don't want to use milk in my coffee. So now mm-hmm. he's using like the oat milk creamer. Mm-hmm. And like mm-hmm. he's like, I feel less bloated. This is actually really great. Like <laughs> right. even if it's like one small thing you can mm-hmm. do, that is an impact. And where you put your dollars matters. Like mm-hmm. the more you're putting dollars into these alternatives and Mm -hmm. into these local systems to get food Mm -hmm. uh, the more those things can flourish and grow and the market will listen to where the dollars go yeah absolutely and there's so many great alternatives out there there are like (laughs) so many the oat milk that you just mentioned great (laughs) yeah um when I first became vegan it was much different world than it is now (laughs) (laughs) yeah I've always been uh dairy intolerant Mm -hmm. lactose intolerant Mm -hmm. that's the word um and I remember the stuff I had to drink as a kid Mm -hmm. I was just like I just don't need anything Mm -hmm. to be a milk I'll just have water yeah (laughs) but now it's like all about it coconut milk yeah uh (laughs) well even what you said like oh I'm lactose intolerant well no you're not a baby cow yeah (laughs) like this milk was not meant for you in the first place you know um this was Mm -hmm. meant for a calf 
that needed to grow very quickly because it's a big animal, you know, so it's heavy and like calorie. It's not healthy for us. I remember I've been an athlete growing up and there's always those commercials, you know, your the the your favorite like athlete would have the milk mustache, mm-hmm. you know. Do you remember those commercials? Oh and yeah, the got milk. The got milk. And you know, I believe that so, so thoroughly, you know, like why would they lie? <laughs> why would why would anyone lie to us, you know? Mm-hmm. Um oh money. I forgot Mm -hmm. (laughs) money. That's a thing. That's a thing. Yeah. But there's so many different alternatives out there and you really do make those choices. Um, Because again, like, yeah, every act you do is, can be a form of advocacy and, and activism. Mm -hmm. Mm. So can you share a rescue story that impacted Mm -hmm. you and your life? I can share. want to talk about the animals. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I can, I can share a couple if you don't mind. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, I, huh. Okay. I'd love to share June B and Susan, if you don't mind. Yeah. Please. Okay. So, um, cause I, uh, you know, there's not many Holly that like rescue stories that have an impact in them. You know, I've been mm. doing rescue for a long time and, and been fortunate to even lead a lot of the national um, rescue efforts at uh, my the previous sanctuary that I worked with. And uh, um, and they, I still can think of each one, even though it's been over a decade. So but when I think of June B and Susan and their story, it resonates to what we were speaking to, like community as well. Um, so I don't know if you remember this, um, it made national news, but there was the the news channels and all the coverage, um, about 40 cows that had escaped a slaughterhouse and were running on the streets of LA. Oh my gosh. Did you hear about that at all or? I think I did when I visited the farm, okay. but I don't think I had before. <laughs> yeah. Um, so if you close your eyes, you can vision that like, right. 40 cows running in the streets of LA. It's quite the scene. Oh yeah. (laughs) It's quite the scene. And so I remember getting a call and that was the, the information we got. 40 cows had escaped the slaughterhouse. We're running, um, on the streets of LA and, um, they were being recaptured and this, the community at large, vegans non-vegans the community showed up and were like you have to save them they just liberated themselves Mm -hmm. they they saw an opportunity to run and they took it and the community showed up for them and you know there was calls to the the slaughterhouse there was news everywhere there was celebrities speaking out and and begging for for the their lives to be saved and sanctuaries you know not just the sanctuary I'd worked for, but like sanctuaries at large were coming forward and saying, I could take some, I can, you know, um, Mm -hmm. we can help support bringing them to sanctuary. And they captured 38 within the first 24 hours. And we got news that they had all been killed. It was devastating. I mean, to say the least for, for them, imagine that right you self-liberate you're running and the the feelings of being with others running for freedom to be captured and killed like it's your worst nightmare um it's out of a horror movie really it's like and i just i remember bawling i remember just absolutely bawling and feeling like I wish we could have done more. I wish we could have saved, like, uh, it was, it was devastating. And the next day we got a call and there was, they had found another, she had evaded everyone. Um, and because of the outpour the day before and the celebrity and the sanctuary community and everyone speaking out, they decided to release her to us. And, we went and got her. Um, they had us come in the middle of the night, <laughs> you know, so there was no other cows there. 
we came and got June Be Free, named by Diane Warren, and um, brought her to to sanctuary. She was exhausted and and tired, and she was terrified. She was absolutely terrified. She didn't know where she was going, right? Um, and so we took off a hand took a hands-off approach. We're like, here's food and water. Here's everything you need. Relax, calm down, get used to your settings, you know? And, Mm -hmm. and we don't need anything from you. We don't need, you know, like you're here, you get to be you and, um, and that's it. And we knew there was one more because they had said 40 and they had, Mm -hmm. they had got 38. And so we were, we did, but we didn't want to be like name that to the slaughterhouse either. We're just yeah. like internally like, okay, are we ready? Like trucks, truck trailer loaded in case we get the call. Like if they're if she's spotted, we can go and mm-hmm. and so it was about a week later, and we Holly we got the call, and I remember grabbing one of my coworkers and colleagues, and I said, let's go let's go, let's go get her. And they were going to release her to us. And so we're like, we saved two. We have to just sit with that. We just have to like, yeah. two lives is better than not. Like, yeah, you know, yeah. just like all of those conversations. And when we got to the slaughterhouse, it was during the day and there was hundreds of other cows. Like, mm. I don't know if you've ever been to a slaughterhouse and I don't no. recommend it, um, but I have quite quite a bit and um I think this time was one of the most traumatizing times um we got there and you know the smell you can feel the fear in the air like you it's like palatable like you can feel the fear and 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 that energy and you just have to like take a deep breath I know from this rescue work you really have to be like I'm I you know, I'm saving this person. Like I'm not getting into a fight with them. You know, I'm not going to, mm-hmm. I'm not going to do anything to hurt the chances of not saving them, you know? And, yeah. And we saw Susan and she had now been out for a week, no water mm. injuries all over her body. Exhausted. I mean, I'm so exhausted. She's back at the slaughterhouse. So she had pure terror on her face. Um, everyone responds differently to fear. Um, some people run, some people fight, some people try to hide, you know, um, typically it's the flight response from prey animals and Susan wasn't having it. She turned and even her pure exhaustion, she was ready to fight for her life. She was ready to continue to fight for her life. And I look over as they're leading cows past us to slaughter. They're leading them right by her. And I'm like, this poor being, how much has she survived already? And to see this, to be in this Mm -hmm. space, like she must be absolutely terrified. So it took a long time to get her on the trailer. And I, uh, I remember as soon as we pulled away from the slaughterhouse, I held my colleague's hand and we just both started crying silently because number one, that scene, that the emotions, the energy from that mm-hmm. doesn't leave you. You know, you have to work through that in one way or another. But yeah. but we were terrified for her. She still didn't know where she was going. You know, we're like, you're safe. You're safe. You're safe. Like, I hope you know mm-hmm. that. Like, but but how can we convey that to her? You know, she's on a trailer. We're in the truck. Yeah. She's horrified she's still. Just horrified. She is, yeah. And so it wasn't until we were pulling up to sanctuary and pulling into where June was, who was already there and been there, you know, for a handful of days at that point. When we started to breathe, we're like, have we been collectively holding our breath for this, whole, you know, drive? Mm-hmm. We pulled in and I remember like, unlocking the back of the the trailer and opening it up to June's area and Susan running off and turning around immediately like okay all right okay and turned back around and June came running down like mooing at her oh and and immediately took over the role of protector and we were 
you know, talking, like watching them and their interaction. And Susan, like June brought her over to the food and water and, and, and Susan laid down probably for the first time in how long and mm. relaxed for a little bit. And, and June stood guard. And, wow. and that was for a few weeks. We were just like, you know, you all bond, relax, calm, you know, and then you mm-hmm. slowly started seeing that fear, that pure terror leave their face. Day by day, they were less cautious. They were less fearful when we entered to clean or provide more food or, you know, do the waters. Um, they wouldn't stomp and like turn to you. They would even like kind of turn their backs and we're like, oh, okay, okay, they're calm. And then we'd mm-hmm. see them sitting and chewing cud together. And we're like, oh, all is well. <laughs> like all is gonna be yeah. okay, it's gonna be okay. Um, and then they finally met the rest of the herd and and you know watching that bonding moment is is just something that will stick with you forever um to this day where they'll um they have the agency if they want to come down for public tours they can if they don't mm-hmm. want to they don't have to they can go do the acres in the back and enjoy life and not engage with people ever if they didn't want to. yeah um but they came down like the first time they had the opportunity they came down and they stood back but they were like watching everyone and watching humans interact with like, you know, the other steers and getting kissed on and loved on. And, and they're probably going like, what is going on there? Yeah. <laughs> like a whole different life. Um, so now where they'll accept, you know, pets and, and scratches and um, the fear is all gone. Mm. And I think for me, why that rescue story stands out so much and has imprinted, you know, on me is these beings first, like to endure everything they endured before even getting to that slaughterhouse, right? They, these, these girls have multiple brands. So had been moved and transported and had that fear probably repeatedly over, over their years. Um, to then seeing an opportunity to save yourself and taking it and running. I'm like, yes, you go, you know, Mm -hmm. like that's beautiful. And, and, and to see how the community spoke out. And these are people, Holly, that were like, save them, save them. I'm sure they were still eating a hamburger. Yeah. They were still probably disconnected completely to that, but they were rooting for them and they were showing up and calling. And I, I just think there's so much power when it comes to community. There's so much beauty in community and seeing how the, the community showed up for them to fight for them as hard as they were fighting for themselves was something to be beautiful or like it, it imprinted on me to be a part of, you know? Um, yeah. And then watching the healing and, and all of that. So. And it shows how that community can make a difference too. Mm. Like, because those two, Susan and June B, were able to be set free because of that outpouring of community. Mm-hmm. That did make a difference in those two lives. And, you know, however small it might seem, it's a huge thing mm-hmm. that can continue to ripple. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Do you think they were most likely dairy cows? No, or... they were for they were for me. Okay. Mm-hmm. And they had just been moved around a number of times. Right. So you go like typically um and it's it's different you know but you'll start at they'll start at one one facility and they'll go to like a feed lot so they get fattened up if they're like used to breed they'll go to a breeding facility so um and then eventually um typically like for dairy cows at like five years old they'll be sent to slaughter after they've produced you know a handful Mm. of babies and then their bodies are spent i mean these are animals that can live up towards of 20 years old but um yeah, so most likely because they're Angus, mm-hmm. you know, cattle, they were they were raised for for the meat consumption. I remember seeing the cows at the farm. They were just the largest <laughs> animals yeah. I have ever seen in my life. Like no cow mm-hmm. I have ever seen because they were from I think these ones that we saw, I can't remember their names, mm-hmm. but came from a slaughterhouse. Mm-hmm. And it was, it, you could really see the difference in what we're doing to these animals. Because mm-hmm. um, they're just, 
it doesn't seem as if they're like living naturally and how their body would have evolved and developed as it would have needed to best support them. Yeah, absolutely. Well, because they're not supposed to live past slaughter age, you know? Mm -hmm. So what we've done is modified them genetically and through selective breeding to, to get very large, very quickly, you know, um, Mm -hmm. Cornish birds that are, um, the birds that are typically used for meat, you have the layer hens that are used for eggs. Um, that's typically like red stars, um, leghorns, you'll have Cornish crosses or Cornish that are used for meat birds. And they're still peeping when they go to slaughter. You, you Sometimes it's difficult to, to see if they're male or female. They're so young, but they're at five pounds already. Wow. You know, because because of that genetic modification and that breeding that we've done. So, wow. yeah, you're right. I mean, Holstein steer, I think you're talking about as well. Um, yeah. Maybe six feet tall, huge and, and 3,000 pounds. And yeah. people are like, I've never seen a cow that big. And I'm like, cause you want it. <laughs> like, yeah, cause it's not normal. It's not normal. Yeah. Um, and for them to live, you know, a life that they can. So mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. thank you for sharing light on that. Cause I think that's something a lot of people don't know either. Mm-hmm. So before we, I know we're getting a little short on time, um, but I guess, what do you think? Hmm. it's going to take me a second to think about how to accurately word Mm -hmm. this because there's so much there. But I guess we've covered this a lot is why the way we eat matters Mm -hmm. because it is a direct relationship with the living beings around us, the environment, the humans, the animals, Mm -hmm. the plants. Um, How can we start to reframe our relationship with animals in the food system. Mm-hmm. Um, I have a, I have a, a short answer since we're on short time too. Yeah. Um, and I really, Holly, I believe that we can reframe our relationship with animals and the food system by working to understand and challenge these historical systems and these underlying logics like motivating the harm, right, of our, of our food system. So when we divest ourselves and our communities from the mechanisms that perpetuate these harms um, and we can articulate and practice and actualize new possibilities, um, that can promote and can promote collective um, thriving of, of humans, the fellow animals and the planet, we can counter the harms of the current food system and truly reframe our relationship with animals in the larger ecosystem at earth. So educate, educate, educate yourselves, think through, question everything. Um, And the more you question, the more you're pushing back on these systems that seem so normal. And you're, the more you're going to understand, right? The more you're going to go, oh, every single thing I'm doing contributes either in a positive or a negative light. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's really important that you name that questioning. And I notice it within myself. And I think it's a, I think this can be a heated conversation among people. Mm -hmm. And I often think it's because when we think about it and we learn um, about how much harm Mm -hmm. is happening in these spaces, we feel guilty. We feel uncomfortable. We feel like we've done something mm-hmm. wrong, but we didn't know we were doing it wrong. Mm-hmm. And I think it's important to acknowledge that one, like discomfort is okay. Mm-hmm. We can be with it. Two, these are a part of like these far bigger systems that, you know, like we, we grew up seeing the got milk ads mm-hmm. thinking like positive association, positive association, mm-hmm. and we're never shown the other side of things. Mm-hmm. So it's not, 
your fault that you didn't know but now that you feel this discomfort what can you do about it mm. are you gonna do you want to just keep pretending you didn't know nothing's wrong or once you do know how can you adjust and I think like I at least noting like for me if I tell myself all right from now on I'm going to be completely vegan from here mm -hmm. on out that feels maybe more intimidating and less mm -hmm. accessible but if I think to myself okay I'm going to try this week not having dairy right. and see how that goes mm -hmm. maybe making it like more baby steps and making smaller choices maybe investing in your local CSA instead of that extra trip to the grocery store mm -hmm. those small things that you can do every day make a big impact Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, adopting a plant-based diet doesn't make you perfect. Yeah. Like it doesn't. And it's just about reducing harm as much as you possibly can. That's it. And everything you do, that's how I, I, I believe it's what I believe mm -hmm. in, in my soul. If you can reduce that, reduce the waste, reduce yeah, embody care to your community, to yourself and, and, and the animals and the, look at yourself as part of the ecosystem. It's mm -hmm. huge, you know, but it's not about being perfect. Who wants to be perfect? That's boring. Um, we can't what, be. Oh, what is, is perfect, you know? Yeah. So I think it's different for every single person, you know, what, what those steps are going to be. Yeah. And I really like that you bring it back to care here, mm. you know, taking care of yourself, taking care of your animal friends, taking care mm. of your plant mm. friends and this whole system that we are a part of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's so important. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So before we go, do you mind sharing how we can continue to support you and your work and the tremendous things you're advocating for in the world? Uh, I... You know, thank you. Thank you for having me on today and, and for sharing your space with me first. You know, I really appreciated the conversation and I know some of the stuff we're talking about can be heavy. And, mm -hmm. and so I, I just, I appreciate that, that's honoring that space um, for me to come on and speak with you all and be in community. Um, I am Right now, I would love for you all to stay tuned because in the coming weeks, um, there will be more information about an exciting new project that I'm co-founding. And <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm really excited. It's, you know, um, it's it speaks to everything we are talking about today. And, um, and then people can follow me on Instagram at uh, Jess underscore do, and that's J-E-S-S underscore d u e um you can also follow the doom ranch on instagram which is my personal permaculture ranch in the high desert of california and that. <laughs> um that's uh t h e underscore d u e m and underscore r a n c h um reach out i would love to hear from people and I'll put all this in the show notes too. And if we have updates on your project by that point, I'll be sure that people can find those in the show notes. Thank you too. so much. Thank you. Yeah, it's um, I just launched that the Doom Ranch Instagram, and it was a little bit nerve wracking to put yourself out that way, there, you know. And um, yeah, but I'm excited to share the progress of it. And thank you so much for holding space for me, Holly. Thank you for taking time to listen to the wise one inside of you today. Please rate, review, and subscribe to this podcast to help it grow. Until the next time, let's keep taking it one breath at a time.